gone over walk never failing our helper he amidst the flood a mortar is being failing for there are ancient for the seeker were God for his craft and power are great and our wicked war hate our earth is not his equal did we in our own shrink and fight our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side the man of God's own choosing the prince of darkness grinned we tremble not for him he trade we can endure for lo his soon is sure one little word shall fail him that word above our earthly powers no thanks to them abide it the spirit and the gifts are ours to him who in the side in let good and kindred go this mortal life our source the body they may kill God should abide is still his kingdom is for ever his kingdom is for ever Christ's kingdom is for ever the gun be gone layman
And uh, let's hope that we get this done. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mom needs to talk about this I guess, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. My mic is not on. That might be because I turned it on better. You want to turn the mic on just a little bit so they can hear? This one? Thanks. How about now? Check, check. Mic check. Check, check. There we go. Is that better? Um, another scene that was really impactful to me um, was the scene where Jesus stopped by the woman at the well. Remember this scene? Did any of you cry during the scene? Yeah, I did. I certainly did. And the reason why it really it was impactful to me was because just the thought that Jesus would go out of his way for you. And if you were in that position, and somebody that's not even living their life like, like, like they're supposed to be, right? And here Jesus goes all the way to meet her at that one spot. And to me, that was just like a, a mind-blowing idea. And to observe that scene play out, it was really impactful to me. But there was other things that I started noticing that really kind of were irking me a little bit. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll talk about it because you obviously know I'm going to share some, of you, some details. I'm choosing not to, in this presentation, by the way, show you a ton of clips from The Chosen. In fact, I only have one clip from The Chosen. And, and I'm going to talk about the production and the people behind the scenes of The Chosen because I think that's more of a productive conversation than showing you things that could be or could not be. You know, you saw it like this, but I saw it like this, and I don't think that's as productive as you hearing out of the horse's mouth of them and what they believe that make the chosen. So, hopefully, we'll be able to get that going here. Um, but one of the scenes that really irked me was in season three, there was a scene between Peter and his wife. And Peter's wife um, uh, was having some struggles. She lost a baby, and she was um, not telling Peter what happened. And so there's this tension between these two characters. And as Peter is sitting there um, um, describing you know, to his wife, like, you know, what's wrong? Please tell me what's wrong. And they're standing in their kitchen. Every single time he goes to talk with his, 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 his wife, somebody comes in. A disciple comes in, Jesus comes in, somebody's breaking into the scene, and then there's this, there's this, you know, he can't talk to his wife about it. So right when they're about ready to have this conversation, there's a knock on the door, and Jesus comes in. And Peter just turns around, and he gets frustrated, and he throws his hands up in the air, what, what, you know, my house is not a meeting place. Awesome. And then, do you have the, this connected to it? Okay, so he says, Jesus, what, what, why are you coming in here? And, and, Jesus looks around and he calls the other disciples in and Peter, once he calls the other disciples in, Peter um, gets frustrated, says, you know, like, my house is not a meeting house, and he storms out. And one of the disciples that walks by says, what's wrong with Peter? And Jesus goes, don't worry, he'll get over it, and invites everybody into the house. I put that thing on pause, and I turned to my kids and I said, do you think that was a nice thing that Jesus said? Do you know what my kids said? No. And I went, oh, look at that little jab. Look at that. Jesus was always sensitive. Jesus would never have barged in and, oh, don't worry, he'll get over it, he'll be a problem. That made him look so insensitive. And so anytime that they're doing this kind of a thing, it bothers me that they're tinkering with the model of who Jesus is in people's minds. All right, let's say a prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, this is not a conversation that uh, is very easy sometimes, and especially if people have been very positively impacted by this particular production. But I believe it's an important conversation, so be with me, be with the technology, help it to be clear, and uh, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and to learn about you from your holy word. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. So in the very beginning of The Chosen, they shot on a lot of sets that were over in Morocco, and it was a very, um, you know, kind of like shot all over the place. Well, now they shoot The Chosen on the Mormon sets. I don't know if you're aware of that. But the, in, in Utah, the Mormons have recreated the Jewish sanctuary, and they have sets that are specifically only able to be used by Mormons. But for whatever reason, they allow them to shoot the chosen on this first time that any other church faith has ever come into their doors and shot on these, these sets. So he has Mormons on his board. He has Mormons involved in the stuff. 
He's, he's using a lot of Mormon in the dialogue. He read the Book of the Mormon, certain parts of it, even though he says he didn't. I found other clips where he says he did. And so here he's talking about Mormonism, and, and he's addressing this idea that, that Christians were like, well, why are you involving all these Mormons? Listen to what he says. So even if I had significant disagreements with the LDS community, which I've learned I have fewer than I thought I did, but even with that, I was okay. I was comfortable with that because as long as they're treating the show properly, that's all that matters. So it's been, I, I can honestly say it's been one of the top three most fascinating and beautiful things about this project has been my growing brother and sisterhood with people of the LDS community that I never would have known otherwise and learning so much about um, about your, your faith tradition um, and realizing for all the stuff that maybe we don't see eye to eye on, that all happened, that's all based on stuff that happened after Jesus was here. Um, the stories of Jesus we do agree on and we we love the same jesus pause pause do we love the same jesus have you ever ever looked into mormonism anyone is that is that the same jesus that i worship no. lds. lds is latter-day saints mormon church they don't even believe jesus is god so i started digging into this how can he make a statement like that? How, how are you going to say all these different faiths? Okay, so you're part of the Mormon church, or you're part of the Jehovah's Witness church, or you're part of the Catholic church, or you're part of these other churches. The one common denominator that we can all agree on is Jesus, but it doesn't matter what faith you're from. Do you know what we call that? We call that ecumenicalism. So I want you to pay attention to what's happening here. He's putting Mormonism in the dialogue. Listen to this piece from The Chosen. Jesus, if you do not renounce your words, we will have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. Common, cut, pause. That is directly quoted from the book Nephi, which is the Book of Mormon. And it says, Behold, I am the law, the light, look unto me, endure to the end, ye shall live, for unto him that endureth to the end I will give eternal life. Now you would hear this on the surface, and you would think, yeah, but isn't Jesus really the law? We often talk about the law as being a description of God, right? So why is this bad? Is Jesus the law, or did he write the immutable law? I want you to think about this. Because if Jesus is the law and Jesus can change something, then he can change the law. Is the law ever going to change? Never, ever. So look at how the devil is so subtly weaving this idea in there that you watch that the law can be changed. Where's Satan going in the end of this thing? He's going to change the times and the laws to the point where the one that comes as the cosmic Christ will tell you, you better observe Sunday, and if you don't observe Sunday, what happens to you? You don't deserve to live. That's coming. And so him saying that he's the law is problematic to me. So I looked up, um, Mormons believe that the Book of Mormon is truer than the Bible. If there's a discrepancy between the Bible and the Book of Mormon, they will 100% always go with the Book of Mormon over the Bible because they say that the Bible's been translated and tinkered with and the Book of Mormon is more currently true. That's not true at all. They believe that Jesus was not incarnated. They believe that Jesus was not God or the God. They believe that Jesus was not the second person of the Trinity. They also believe that he was the spirit brother of everyone, including Satan. Meaning, if you understand Mormonism, they believe that the spirits were these little babies, like spiritual babies up in heaven, and they were assigned down to the body. So Jesus was literally just assigned to be Jesus and his soul. Do you remember the movie Soul? Anybody remember that movie that came out, Pixar's Soul? That's exactly what they discussed. That was Mormonism. So all those little soul babies that were up in the sky and get assigned down to bodies, that comes out of Mormonism. And so Jesus, they say, is married to um, Mary and Martha, both Mary and Martha, making Jesus basically a polygamist. They also believe that Jesus was a created being, not an incarnated being. So is this the same Jesus? No, it's not the same Jesus. 
And so I find that fascinating that he said that they believe that he is the same Jesus. Now, what does the Bible say about doctrine? Wasn't doctrine important to Jesus? John 7, 17 says, If anyone, do, uh, anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is of God or whether I speak of my own authority. Doctrine was very important to Jesus. He didn't say throw out the Bible or throw out the doctrine. He said that the, the, the scriptures are the ones that testify of me, right? Doctrine is going to tell you whether or not it comes from God or whether it comes from uh, um, um, a man's own thinking. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this speaks to the point of, was Jesus incarnate before he became Jesus? Well, yes, he was, because the Bible tells us that he was, right? In fact, it says that all things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. We know that Jesus existed and became the Son of God. He was not created to do that. So that's not the same perspective that the Mormon church believes. Now, if you recognize the building behind him, does anybody recognize this building? Okay, St. Peter's Square. So he is an evangelical. He is a Roman Catholic. So they're going into St. Peter's Square, and they're discussing about the images that are in St. Peter's Square, whether it be the dead saints or whether it be things that are on the wall, holy items and things like that. And listen to this conversation as they're discussing it. He's saying, I think this stuff is kind of like idolatry. And he's saying that, you know what, we've been very hard on the Catholics, and I think that we actually shouldn't be that hard on them. In fact, we should kind of back off of this idolatry thing a little bit. Listen to this. I believe that Protestants have gone too far in the opposite direction and become almost skeptical of art and skeptical of imagery because they don't want to be idolatrous and because they don't want to be so symbolic that, that you miss out on the truth of what's being said, that these relics feel like idols to some Protestants. And I've come to believe, well, we Protestants, I think, have missed out on some truly great opportunities to be artistic. And as an artist myself, I'm like, yeah, I, I do that. I, I, I create symbols sometimes in my work. I create metaphor. I think that there's danger in both sides. I think both sides can become, one can become too idolatrous, one can become too dismissive. And yeah. I don't think either Two of answers. us are in, in, no, I don't any, think so either. in that camp. On but, the, but, but, and I've grown to over the years, like when I first used to come to these places, I would, I would show up and I'd be like, this feels wrong to me. Mm. And now that I know so many more uh, Catholic brothers and sisters who I believe share the same passion for Jesus that I do and just uh, have a different worship approach and style, I go, okay, I, I can see, I see, I do see it differently. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting conversation. When I came to this place in the first place, it felt wrong inside of my spirit. We should not be worshiping things. That feels wrong. But you know what? Now that I know a Catholic and I became friends with him, I really don't feel that way anymore. And maybe we've just been too hard on them. We call this ecumenicalism. We call this ecumenical movement of roping in, doesn't matter if you're Mormon, doesn't matter if you're Jehovah's Witness, doesn't matter if you're Catholic, doesn't matter if you're all these different faiths, can find a common denominator in Jesus. Let me ask you a question. For those of you, I know some of you in the room were raised in Catholicism. Is Catholicism Christianity? No. No. You know, in St. Peter's Square, I don't know if you've ever seen the auditorium that the Pope the Pope speaks up. I didn't put the picture in here, but have you ever seen the snake head building? Isn't that crazy? It's really crazy. Literally, the Pope is speaking in the mouth of the serpent. In the building, it has eyes and the fangs, and from the stage, he is in the mouth of the serpent. And when you look at the outside of the building, it's in the shape of a serpent's head. Is that not insane? I will put a picture on here later. I did not put it in here right now, but I'll put it up here later if you guys want to see that picture. So there is some very problematic things with these statements. The Bible tells us about having graven images or idolatry. This is not okay. Never is it okay. We should not relax. We should not just, oh, okay, well, now that I know Catholics, eh, it's, it's okay. We don't, we, we don't have to be so hard on them about this. That's not what the Bible tells me. Tell me, steer clear of that. Don't get involved in idolatry in any way, shape, or form. Um, so this is inside St. Peter's Square. This is the guy that plays Jesus, Jonathan Rumi, okay? 
And here he is praying to the spirit, praying to the, um, this particular dead saint. And this is what it says, visiting this Saint Padre. So this is the guy who plays Jesus. This is his Instagram page. He said that this particular saint right here was the most powerful and uh, uh, saints of witnesses to the suffering and miracles of Christ in the 20th century, as well as the one whom I've had personal interactions. He died many years before Jonathan was, was, bear, uh, was born. He's been dead for 50 years, so how do you have personal interactions with a dead saint? That's a question that I would ask, right? And so here, as he's sitting here um, having this, this time with this particular uh, uh, saint, I don't know if this looks forward here. So as he's sitting here um, um, praying with him, it's really kind of interesting. I, I, I put another picture in here. I don't know why that stopped. Oh, probably because you guys are messing with that. It's okay. Just, yeah, it's okay. So when you pray to a dead saint, um, they call that necromancy. And that's praying to someone who's dead. That is not okay. The Bible speaks very specifically about that. And this happens... Um, and it's quite common in Catholicism. They don't see this as being some super bad thing. So listen to the reporter. This is a K-Love thing, TBN. TBN, I think, is Catholic. So, but it's really interesting. As they are sitting there um, reporting on the Chosen, everybody loves the Chosen. Listen to how she speaks about the Chosen. It has been a huge hit. It's such an easy thing to watch like it comp the bible's complicated and sometimes hard to understand but watching the chosen has really broken down jesus and truly who he is we want to introduce the authentic jesus to a billion people and i believe the show is, is is kind of an unvarnished look at the authentic jesus okay so what she says is the bible is very complicated very hard to understand but the chosen has made a lot of people understand it in a whole new way have you heard this before right People go, I feel like I've connected to Jesus, but the chosen is a made-up story. So what he's saying is that this is an authentic picture of Jesus and the chosen that is an unvarnished view of Jesus. Really? Really? Because I, I kind of thought this was an unvarnished view of Jesus right here. So we have to now go to a one step away from thus saith the word of God to understand how to have a connection with this Jesus. Remember, the only way that the devil can beat you literally is to take you out of thus saith the word of God. God said, don't eat this fruit. The snake said, go ahead and eat the fruit. God said, you'll die. The snake said, don't die, right? What would have happened if we would have listened to the words of God? Wouldn't be here, right? In fact, we discounted the words of God. When Satan came at Jesus in the desert and tried to tempt him, he didn't show up in a dark figure and was like, turn these stones into bread. He didn't do that at all. In fact, he showed up as an angel of light, I guarantee you. And it wasn't until he spoke. If you are the son of God, back up in the story, Jesus gets baptized. He hears, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus would have went, ding. Any angel that was present would have noticed that I got baptized and would have heard the voice of God tell me that I'm his son. No angel would have questioned that. I know who you are. Because it's changing the words of God. Does that make sense? So the way that the devil can beat you is if you don't have a grounded foundation on the Bible. So if he's going to come as a cosmic Jesus, what does he have to do to your picture of Jesus? Take you one step away from the Bible. So it tells me that when I'm sitting here getting a stamp of Jesus, a picture of Jesus, and a picture is worth a thousand words, burned into my brain that is not based on the Bible, somebody is sitting around and making up the story of this character that tells me that that's alarming, giving you a picture that is not based on the Bible. Does that make sense? So here, listen to them talking about who's actually writing The Chosen. We've, we've developed a trust in each other that uh, I, th I feel like we're on the same, like it's not a marriage, but it's like, I feel like there's like a God, we, we, we both know that God is telling this story and we're just trying to find it. So God is telling the story. He keeps saying that God is helping him write this. God is helping him do this. So this interview that I want to show you right here is the two guys that make the music. And they, one of them was in a band called Jars of Clay, which was a Christian band way back in the 90s. And he's very, very on the fence of Christianity to begin with. In fact, from this interview, you will see he's very animosity. He has a lot of animosity towards Christianity. So he's barely on the fence of even identifying as Christian. In fact, 
you can see his sarcasm about it and stuff like this come through. And the other guy that's sitting to his right is very much so barely Christian as well. He's wearing Buddhist things, and I'll show you a couple things about his Buddhist faith. And so can you blend Buddhism and Christianity together? No, you cannot. And these two guys are making the music, but listen to what he says the entire show is all about. Well, why do Oops. Hold on. Ah. Dan, I'm curious. No. One more back. Well, why do you think The Chosen, it has universal appeal. You talked about that. I mean, it's not just Christian audiences. Listen it's mainstream say. audiences. Ecumenical. People that don't know Christ at all are loving this show. Mm -hmm. What is driving this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think it's hard to find somebody who doesn't know Christ at all. Um, but I think they know a version of religion or a version of faith. Um, I think... The stories we tell about Jesus are not very compelling. Um, yeah. and, and so I think when they see this version of Jesus portrayed, I think it really does. It, it matters that he's merciful, that he's, he's extending a lot of grace. Um, he has his own flaws in a human way. Like, he's very relatable and... Um, and gracious, and I think people need to see that mm -hmm. that side of Jesus because we've a lot of us have been force fed, um, you know, a, a version of Jesus that only cares about our behaviors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and every episode, the story pushes back on that. You know, every episode, it tries to turn the table on, oh, your behavior is not actually what matters. It is. It is the inner workings of your heart and your soul that will matter. Um, and he keeps kind of pushing that, you know, there's no shame, there's no condemnation. There's those kinds of ideas that we, we've gotten out of the habit of talking about in the church at large. I think it's, if, if people have a, an experience in the church, most often it's something that is focused on their behavior. See, what did I tell you before? If it, it has to be a blend, though. It cannot be about your obedience will save you. Your obedience will not save you. Does that make sense? It's not a focus on only your obedience. It's a blending of your heart mixed with your obedience. It's love and judgment, kissing each other. It's those two concepts must be preached together. And what's happening here is they're branding in everybody's mind. It has nothing to do with your obedience. Doesn't matter what you do. All it matters about, check the tick box, do you believe in Jesus, yes or no? That's not what my Bible tells me. Here is they that, here is the patience of the saints. Here is they that keep the, of God and have the faith of. So that is a blend of people that are obedient. Would you, would you agree with that? So the fact that he said every single episode pushes back on obedience. That's why they had Peter fishing on the Sabbath. Do they realize what a problem that is in the Jews' mind? You don't fish on the Sabbath. And why would Jesus have chosen, you know, um, th there's no evidence of that in the Bible. Those are very, very complex things to, to put out there. So she talks in a little bit about the music, because these two guys make the music. And I didn't have time to go over a music presentation and talk to you about music, but you do realize that music is a very intricate part of worship, right? Why do we play music before we make an altar call? Does somebody give me the real reason why that happens? What does it do? Okay, to touch the emotions, right? Do you know what music does? Is it opens the heart to receive the message. So when you are playing certain types of music, it can open the heart, and actually they have done studies. Do you know what an fMRI machine is? That's a functional you know, um, machine that's following the hemoglobin in your blood has a lot of iron in it. So it's a big round donut looking magnet they put you in and they can see what parts of your brain are working and all this, right? They've tested 2,500 people in an fMRI machine playing them random Baroque uh, orchestra music and, and symphony type music. 
that they've never heard of before, and they chose very obscure things that people did not know or have ever heard that before, and you know what they found consistently? The same patterns in every single person's brain, meaning they were experiencing what the designer of the music wanted them to experience, and it was universally happening over everybody. So the music gives you a perspective. Do you remember the story, or did you ever read in Mrs. White's writings when Satan was trying to, to decide whether he was going to publicly come out and, and, and start an outright rebellion in heaven, and all of the angels began to sing in adoration to the Father and Son? And she writes about how much Satan hated Jesus. He hated him with every fiber of his being, but the second that the angel sung, his, his hatred for him melted away, and he began to sing in adoration of love to the Father and to the Son. Do you remember her writing that? It's fascinating. Why? Because that's the power of music. You get roped into that experience. Why do some people cry when you hear certain hymns? You know, there's certain hymns I actually cannot, cannot, cannot sing. I can't sing because I get choked up. Why? Because of the experience that I'm experiencing and feeling of the people that wrote that hymn. We are experiencing it like it's a sermon. So when the two guys that write the music for the chosen are super into Buddhism or music of the world, that raises a red flag in my mind. And they said that they were putting Buddhist sounds in the story. That's why all of the music in the background is like this. He, they're using and mixing Buddhist sounds. So listen to this. They're describing in here um, um, some of the things that they were putting in a previous project that they had worked with Dallas. Dan, I'm curious, why were you trying to push Dallas away from the Christian music space? Oh, uh, for that, it was just more a matter of authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, at that time in the year 2000, in the year 2000, um, the music that was happening in, in the Christian space was, um, you know, it, it didn't fit the film. Um, he needed music that was more connected to the Delta Blues and more connected to, like there's a record label out of Mississippi called Fat Possum Records and, um, and our, you know, groups like the Rolling Stones who are, um, have a lot of really great blues elements in their music. I really wanted to push that angle for him. So, you know, to put it in a Christian piece of Christ Christian movies, to sit there and have that kind of conversation and say the Rolling Stones have really good music that you should put in there really tells you somewhere where his theological head is at. So the guy that's sitting to his right, his name is Matthew Nelson. I took the screenshot. This is his, his actual website. It's called Zen Space. What is Zen? Zen is Buddhism, right? And even on his website, this is the bottom of his website right here, it says the Zen gardener is not interfering with nature because he is nature. And he's this quote from Alan Watts, who's a Buddhist guy. So here, why would you have this Buddhist guy making the Christian music that's supposed to go and stamp the feelings in everybody's mind of who Jesus is? Do you realize a picture of Jesus is being stamped into everybody's mind right now? So I find that very problematic. This is, the, this is his Instagram page. That's Buddhism. That's Buddhism. That's Buddhism. And he has a picture of a martini where he says, the Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. That's blasphemous. Do you think that the devil can work through somebody that's not sold out to God? Absolutely. And so I find that problematic, that these are the kind of people that are working behind the scenes. Do you know that the, um, the guy who directed this and wrote this, do you know his parents are the ones that came out with the Left Behind series? That's his dad. That's his dad. So there's some questionable material here that is very interesting. And when I saw this, this made a whole lot of sense. He is a Knights Templar. That is a Knights Templar outfit. And here he is going to tell you he was knighted as a Knights Templar. I'm wearing a mantle and a cross with a little crown on it, uh, a Knight's Cross. Uh, five years ago, I was uh, knighted by the order, the uh, solemn uh, sovereign military order of the Temple of Jerusalem. I lost my mind there for a second. Um, essentially, the Knights Templar, which is what that is. So, does it shock you that the guy that is stamping his face in everybody's mind right now, that he's Jesus, is a Knights Templar? 
the military branch of the, of the Catholic Church, and he's totally Catholic, does that shock you that he's Jesus? Do you know what the Knights Templar is? Here's his Instagram page, Jonathan Rumi's official thing, and he says he went to an event, 2020, and it says, in this epic inaugural event, on the behalf of my fellow Templar brothers and sisters, we are so grateful and proud of it. Here's a picture of the Knights Templar. This structure right here is the structure of Freemasonry. These are all the levels of Freemasonry that you can get to. That is a 33rd degree Freemason. That is a Knights Templar. There is no step above a Knights Templar. Does it shock you that the very guy that is playing Jesus is literally the military branch of this structure? Oh man, the devil is so smart. He is so smart. He is so smart. And our church is, is no different than many other churches. Look at this. I watched three seasons of this. It wasn't until I literally was sitting there going, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't feel right. This doesn't sound right. They said this. This doesn't, what, what are they doing here? It took me a while before I actually backed up and said, let me look at who these people are. Here he is, right here, on the Chosen's Facebook page. Somebody had commented in and wrote into them and said, Dallas, that's the creator of the Chosen, Jonathan is the, is the play that guy that plays Jesus, said, repent John, Dallas and Jonathan of your blasphemy and twisting of the scriptures, repent of your Freemasonry and your promotion of your true God, Lucifer, and look at what they wrote right here. No, no, I will not repent of that. <laughs> Official chosen. Do you guys believe we're in a war? He's coming out. He's coming out. We're watching him come out. He's prepared the way. He's playing both sides. Doesn't matter about your rules. You just watch me show you a bunch of cartoons. You watch me show you a bunch of things from the world saying, doesn't matter about your rules. Doesn't matter about your rules. Now he's stamping a Jesus in everybody's mind that it doesn't matter about your rules. That's the devil. Be careful with this. Be careful with this. Here he is right here. I find this really interesting. Every single interview, and you'll notice this now, if you want to look this up, you go, you go on YouTube, you look this up. Every single interview, he's wearing two rings with skulls on either one of the rings. Why? Look at this. Scully, got a brother. Yeah, that's his brother, Maury. Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Younger brother, sound a bit older. Hey, how are you? How you been? Uh, you know, hey, what do you think? Is good? Right, hey, hey, good. Right, Scully. Maury and Mary. That's Mary there, Our Lady of Guadalupe. So, dynamic duo, yeah? In a way. Cool. So that's that. Let me ask you a question. What finger was Mary on? You guys, it's in front of our face. It's right in front of our face. If you are an actor, I spent six years chasing trying to be an actor, and you dive into a character, you want to know everything there is to know about that character. And so I find it very interesting that if he's playing Jesus and he's diving into the character of Jesus, how can you not read that I am the resurrection and the life, that I am the very definition of life? that I have no darkness inside of me, that I have no death inside of me. Why would the guy that's stamping the very image of Jesus in everybody's mind be having two symbols of death on his fingers? You ask that question. They worship the dead. It's a death cult. It's a death cult. Yes, yes. That does not shock me. So here... They're sitting there talking about their acting process. How do you get into the headspace to play God? That's what he's asking him. And so listen to how he responds to this. 
So talk about how you approach it when you're reading the scripts and when you're, you know, for you, this is very personal. A lot of what I've noticed in, you know, many portrayals of Jesus have, have been super stoic. It's like, well, they're limited to the time that they have with the lines from the gospel, from scripture, and then they got to move on and tell this story in a very limited window of time, whereas we, we have the opportunity to let this breathe a little bit. So for me, I think it's knowing that and then really just trying to empty myself of everything that is me uh, in service to being open as a channel for the spirit to come and work through me and essentially raise my game as a human being. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to channel something. In fact, if you empty yourself out, what's the story that Jesus told? The man that emptied his mind and swept up his mind and, and the demon went out, he went around and he came back to check on the man's house and the man had swept up his house but didn't fill it with anything. So what did the demon do? He went out and he got seven more unclean spirits and he came back into the man. He was worse off than he was before. What that tells me is that we are an empty vessel. You're either filled with the Holy Spirit or if you are empty, only Jesus is a gentleman. The devil will come into your head and literally bring his friends with him and he will not ask you for permission. Only Jesus will knock on the door of your heart. Some versions of the Bible tell you in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, there shall not be found among you anyone that passeth his son or his daughter through the fires or that uses divination or a channel or, or someone that does necromancy or channels spirits, familiar spirits. Some versions tell you channeling is not okay in the Bible. So the guy that's playing Jesus is channeling something. Now I'm going to give him the benefit of doubt. Maybe he thinks he's channeling the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's what he actually said. Maybe that's actually what he was meaning. I'm going to give him that benefit of the doubt. But I know if you're involved in idolatry, you're involved in emptying your mind out, you're involved in praying to, this, to the saints of the dead, you're involved in Freemasonry, secret societies, I'm going to bet, I'm just going to go out on a limb here, that if you do those things, the devil will use you. Can I say that? So here are these two guys. I'm going to skip through show, some of this just for the sake the of show. time. Um, so then they put him in a film. Here he is right here that got released this last year called The Jesus Revolution. And in The Jesus Revolution, it's about a... a um, a hippie pastor, does anybody remember when this like Jesus movement was happening? All right, so you knew a little bit about it. So there was a movement back in the 70s called the Jesus, Jesus movement where the, the pendulum had swung to a godless society. Everybody was hippie, didn't care about God, and the world was primed to accept some kind of God because there was, there was literally just, it we've gone to godlessness, and then it swings back. This is what the devil always does. He does this kind of a thing, right? And aren't we swinging much, 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 well, I should say this way, much, 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 much left, right? People are just ready to throw God out the window, take him out of the schools, do all these kind of things, right? It's going to get very, very, very far weird until people go, I want something, just don't make us have that. We'll take religion, doesn't matter what you give us, and that's when the devil comes in and he goes, I got your religion, it's right here. That's what he's doing. And so when this pendulum swing swung back in the 70s, it's not by chance that they asked him to be the guy that's in the story. So here the news, Fox is obviously saying, what about this Jesus revolution? Tell me about this movie. And, and, and isn't this amazing that these kind of revolutions are starting to happen right now? There's revivals happening across our country. Listen to what she says. So I think a lot of people might forget or they weren't even alive when this you know, story came about. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the Jesus revolution, how it changed religion across the country? Yeah, so uh, the Jesus Revolution movement basically um, happened, well, the, what we focus on in this movie is this meeting of this uh, charismatic hippie street preacher named Lonnie Frisbee and this conservative pastor played by Kelsey Grammer, as you saw there, uh, named Chuck Smith. And uh, Chuck's church was dwindling, and so he uh, he 
wanted to know how to reach the hippies and in walks Lonnie Frisbee and they say it was like nitro met glycerin and there was just this explosion of the spirit and um, Lonnie started preaching with Chuck and hippies started coming to church by the droves. I mean, Lonnie could just walk to a beach and start preaching and all these kids, these young, troubled, lost souls, hippies, disillusioned, you know, former addicts started coming to church and getting saved and uh it just it just uh sparked this this giant revival that swept acro across the country and ultimately the globe and um i think we're seeing a little bit of that now in places like asbury university so isn't that interesting that all of a sudden in this time what he said there what a great thing people now starting to wake up and come to come to church right and come to believing in God. And, and isn't that a good thing? Isn't that what we should be praying for? In fact, isn't that what we're, as a church, trying to go out and witness to people? Doesn't that all sound good? It really does. It sounds good. I'm not, this is not a trick question. It sounds really good. But what is happening, actually? Because this guy, Lonnie Frisbee, that he's playing was, was, was literally not a straight shooter. Listen to even, this is one of the guys, um, his name is Greg Laurie, he actually went through that, he's one of the producers of the movie, I think he's also a pastor, and listen to, he's on Kurt Cameron's show, and he's talking about it, and he's saying, look it, the stage is ironically set for exactly what happened back then, it will happen again, and it's like interesting that it's happening right now, listen to this. So when I became a Christian in 1970, I didn't know what an awakening was, I didn't know what a revival was. I didn't even know what church was. And so when I went to church for the first time at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, which was in the throes of the Jesus movement, I walked smack dab into the middle of a spiritual awakening. And it wasn't until later I realized it, but Time Magazine very astutely described it as a revolution. So I think in the church, restoration, revival, revolution for us is getting back to God's original template hmm. of the early church that turned their world upside down. And, and that Jesus revolution was really taking place strongly here in Southern California, and yeah. you were a part of that. Do you have any favorite memories of what was going on during that time that you think back to? Yeah, well, you know, it, to me it was like, <clears throat> there was just a very special feeling when you walked into it. Um, no one was ever late for church. Everyone was early, because there were no seats. And you walked into, this tiny little sanctuary that was overflowing with a lot of young people, but people of all ages. There was a sense of, a, of anticipation, excitement. Uh, contemporary worship music was being born right there mm -hmm. because it really didn't exist. Prior to this time, it was like, you know, your basic hymns and maybe your occasional sort of sing-along song like you would do at a camp. Campfire. But we didn't have what we would call worship music as we know it today. Like what we would sing a, a song by Chris Tomlin or Phil Wickham or, or all these songs we sing today, that didn't exist yet. Uh, for that fact, contemporary Christian music did not exist. Most churches would have a key, uh, piano on one side, an organ on the other, and the occasional odd acoustic guitar, you know? But all of a sudden we have electric guitars, amplifiers, drum kits, and I watched this happen before my eyes, so it was very exciting to us. Mm. And and it's the, the memories are very strong still. And, and I pray that this happens again. I know it would feel different because we're in a different time culturally, yet I do find parallels between the time we're in right now mm. and the early 70s. Really strong parallels. So isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that before this revolution, there was not these kind of things? That all of a sudden we start noticing these kind of things coming into the church. And when these things come into the church, what happens? Right? Do you know Mrs. White cautioned against that? She wrote a, a few things about that. I remember watching um, Walter Weith one time, and he was asked the question, Hey, Walter, what do you think of all these drums and stuff that are starting to come into the church? And he goes, It's great. I love it. And then he began to continue to preach. So somebody raised their hand afterwards and been like, well, M Mr. Walter, why did you say that you loved it? And he said, oh, well, because Mrs. White comments that right before the second coming of Jesus, all sorts of uncouth things will come into the sanctuary. We're going home soon. <laughs> Literally. Did is, you have a... Isn't there a, um, an altar revival? There is. Happening? There is. There, it, it happened and was broken up, but yes. There, there, there is a revivals going on on a lot of campuses right now. So I want to share this with you because look at this. Watch this. 
Patriarchs and Prophets. This is not one of Mrs. White's obscure writings, okay? Then that wicked will be revealed that the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9, that's where it says the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance to how Satan works, right? He'll come with all sorts of lying signs and wonders. She's commenting on this verse, and she's saying that the coming of the lawless one is after, or the coming of Jesus is after the lawless one has his time. Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, points to the special working of Satan in spiritualism as an event to take place immediately before the second advent of Christ. So what happens is she says that a revival of, of true godliness will happen. It's after the working of Satan with all these signs, powers, and wonders that before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of, God, of primitive godliness has not been witnessed since the apostolic time. So that's the time when we see that the light of God's glory goes around the world. That's what she's talking about. There will be a revival in the church, true revival, that has not been seen since apostolic times. And she says, the spirit of the power of God will be poured out upon his children. And at that time, many will separate themselves from those churches which have a love of the world. So people that don't care about the world, uh, don't care about the world, they don't want to be a part of a church that says it doesn't matter about your behavior. They say, I want to follow what God is asking me to follow. And that the love of the world has supplanted their love for God and his word. Many, both ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused them to proclaim at the time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. So the enemy of souls desires to hinder this work and before the time of such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. There will be a counterfeit revival that pops up that literally says it has nothing to do with your behavior. Check the box. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes or no? Look at what she says. Oh, I didn't finish this. Um, in those churches whom he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be a great religious interest Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelous for them, and the work is that of another spirit. Look at this. There is thought to be a great religious interest. Everybody loves the chosen. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness. Everybody's excited about it. You could be atheist and you're excited about it. Everybody's getting a religious interest, but it has nothing to do with that. And they're working marvelously for them. It's another spirit. A religious guise, Satan seeks to extend his influence over the Christian world. That comes from the great controversy. That's once again not a side little thing that she wrote. Young men and women will be lifted up and regard themselves as wonderfully favored, called to do something great. There will be conversions of many of a particular order, but they will not bear the divine signature. Immorality will come in. It doesn't matter what you do. Some of the things will be an extravagance, and many will make shipwreck of their faith. You guys were watching a revival, a religious interest happening that does not care about your behavior. That to me is a false revival before the people of God light up the world with his character, his glory. Does that make sense? In 1966, Time Magazine wrote on a, a cover of the Time Magazine, Is God Dead? Look at only a few years later, they write this picture of Jesus. And so listen to what he says about this movie, Jesus Revolution. This is the most, let me say something that might sound odd. This is the most unchristian Christian movie I've ever seen that has more gospel than any Christian film I've seen. Let me define what I mean by unchristian Christian. A lot of times, some Christian films, they always are very neat and tidy and everything works out perfectly. This is an honest film, at times gritty, telling the story of a young Greg and a young Kathy searching for God in all the wrong places, conflicts that Lonnie had with Chuck and how things were ultimately resolved. It's honest. But then it has gospel in it because there's a scene when you baptize my character played by Joe Courtney and, and you did such an amazing job leading him in a prayer to accept Christ. And I...
so don't you think that's an interesting statement to say this is the most unchristian Christian view? And he's saying they showed a lot of like things that are like just he's gritty, meaning he didn't really actually really convert completely. Do you know that Lonnie Frisbee died of AIDS? He was a homosexual, cheated on his wife all the time, constantly struggled with drugs, would still do drugs, and then he would baptize people. Did you know that? Do you find that really interesting? That you would do drugs and then all of a sudden like baptize people under that influence? Who do you think's controlling your mind at that point? Joel, I want to ask. So here he is sitting here talking to the director of The Chosen and the director of Jesus Revolution. And they're asking him, listen to how he says this is an ecumenical movement. It's sweeping everybody underneath this banner. Who is Lonnie Frisbee? And what about that scene when you were filming it? Uh for you, Jonathan, uh, had an impact as well. So Lonnie name? Frisbee was this vessel of the Holy Spirit. He was um, a man, or a, really a kid. He was a young, young man um, who came from a very, very troubled childhood. I mean, his most of his life was filled with suffering from the time he was about three years old uh, up until he was a teenager and he left home and... and um, and uh, when he actually, when God called him to become a minister, uh, he was high on LSD in the mountains of Palm Springs. And uh, literally, like, the, the story is that this, the, this vibration descended over the canyon, and he had this vision of Jesus pointing him to the Pacific Ocean, and, which, of course, he couldn't actually see from Palm Springs. It's too far. It's, like, hours away. But he saw... Jesus showed him the Pacific Ocean, and, and instead of being filled with water, it was filled with these kids, these teenagers, these hippies that were yearning for, for God desperately. And he told them, you are going to bring these souls to me. And he literally sobered out of that vision, went down the mountain like Moses, preaching the gospel to anybody who would listen. So here he's high, and this is the voice of one of his friends. There was a documentary that was made and Judy Menston is, um, is a friend of Lonnie Frisbee, the guy that he was playing. And listen to what she says about him still doing drugs. Hmm. Okay, maybe I didn't have that. There we go. Hmm? Ah, okay. You'll have to trust me on that one. I don't know why that didn't play. But um, there is a... She's literally there talking about an experience that Lonnie Frisbee laid out on the, on the thing that a bunch of kids were at, a bunch of different drugs. They all took LSD, and then he started preaching about John the Baptist, and then he started baptizing people. It was quite fascinating listening to that. Um, here is Lonnie Frisbee. That's Lonnie Frisbee. So listen to what he said. He was a Catholic mystic. Listen to this. This is Father Lonnie. My calling is apostolic in nature. I am a seeing prophet. That means that uh, I experience in my mind what the Catholics call uh, infused prayer with God. And mystics experience this. And it's called infused prayer with God. Us Protestants don't know about any of that because it comes out of Catholic theology. But I am a mystic, and I experience infused prayer with God, and I'm a seer, and the Lord will go. And you'll show me things in the Spirit that are more real than what's happening in front of me. He calls himself a prophet? He calls himself that he's a seer? He calls himself a mystic? They were addressed him in the very beginning as Father Lonnie? I mean, there's some very problematic things with this person. And so here he is. Um, um, he's inspiring a bunch of other preachers. So what you're going to watch right here in 1967 is other hippie preachers that are preaching similar messages to Lonnie Frisbee. And they start telling you, it doesn't matter. You can still do drugs, and you can go ahead and, and, and uh, be a part of God's kingdom. Well, what we think is that everybody 
Everybody should accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and right. be Amen. saved. Right. And then quit their habits, Jesus quit their LSD. Right. We're not going but to you say that, fellas, but the Lord say that. You hey, fellas told me you went out and took LSD and read the book of Revelation. Now, I'm getting a little angry because I can, I go out in the street preaching Dude, that Christ right. delivers, and you uh, guys are out here preaching can you, that you can, can you, smoke pot, you can take LSD, and I think that's a permissive can you, statement that's right, going to right. damn the lives of uh, thousands of our teenagers. I hope, I hope all of you have noticed that I talk about God, and this gentleman talks about drugs. You're talking about using them. I'm talking about no, being cured from them. Know. Reverend Wilkerson, you seem to be quite angry. I, I think so. I, I'm tired of these Bob Dylan preachers and Norm Mailer kind of ministers who go around the streets telling these kids that they can have all this in Jesus too. They can smoke pot, they can take LSD. And, and I have 23 cents for narcotic addicts and they call me, uh, they talk about love and they're ready to slap me in the face. And that's the trouble with hate Asper. We need more ministers down there preaching a uh, that these kids can clean up. These kids, they aren't cleaning up anybody. I think sometimes they're indulging as much as anybody else. Do you notice this, the message of victory over sin? Do you notice that? Even back then, those messages were being preached by certain preachers. That God wants to clean you up. That God is not asking you to sit there and continue in your life of sin. That God wants to take you out of that. And there was a whole class of preachers that came out of Lonnie Frisbee's um, era where they were like, it doesn't matter what you do. You can do whatever you want to do. You just all got to sudden believe in Jesus. This is Lonnie Frisbee's wife, and she said that when she married him, he told her that he was gay. When Lonnie asked me to marry him at that particular time is when he told me that he was gay. He didn't say it as though he was still gay, but that, that he had been saved out of that lifestyle. So here is Chuck Smith, the guy that... that um, that's, that's Chuck Smith, the guy that he walked into his church. So the voice that you're going to hear is Chuck Smith's son. So listen to the conversation that Chuck Smith had about Lonnie Frisbee. My dad's philosophy of ministry had harmed Lonnie and Connie's marriage. Um, I know that, that Lonnie and Connie both had talked to my dad about this. I remember making the appointment and, and the, he asked me what it was for and I said, well, marriage counseling. And, um, uh, and then Chuck Smith told, uh, looked at me and he said, the only thing that's important right now, Connie, is that people are getting saved. Um, and my dad's belief was that um, the hierarchy of values was God, ministry, family. I can just tell that Lonnie knew, now had a carte blanche to be as irresponsible as he wanted to be. And that's when, um, that's when I felt like I, had to st I was fighting God for my husband's attention. All right, so I got it. I'm going to flash through a little bit of this because I'm just trying to build a case to you who this guy that he was playing. Remember what, remember what Jonathan, this actor right here, just said? He was an instrument of the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. He lived an awful, terrible life. In fact, Calvary Chapel ended up sending him out because of his homosexuality, cheating on his wife, doing drugs, all those things. They constantly sent him out. So now they're whitewashing that and playing a version of that, that all he was was out there winning souls. And so he goes to find the grave of Lonnie Frisbee, which is in California, in the, is buried in San Francisco in the Crystal Cathedral. He goes and finds his grave, and he lays down next to him, and he prays to dead Lonnie Frisbee. Here he is talking about this. Before I started work, I went over to Christ Cathedral, and uh, I, I sat by his grave, and I prayed a rosary with him. Oh, he didn't realize he's buried there, too. He's, oh, yeah, he's buried there. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to have to go take a look at that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful. In fact, I sat down and I prayed with him. Um, the, the, the space just to his right is empty, so I got to sit down. or lie. At one point, I even lied down because I just thought it would be kind of interesting to try to connect in some way. That's probably more information than you need or may even <laughs> want to publish. But that said, uh, I, you know, I, it's the, the truth. And so I finished praying with him. And I said, Lonnie, I want to honor you with this film. And I really want to, um, to, to, to bring justice and, and, you know, the testament to the gifts of God's grace and, and powers that you, you know, displayed 
while you were on this earth. And so if this is a good idea that I do this film, have somebody give me a sign. Give me a sign, have God give me a sign. Mm -hmm. And the minute the words left my mouth, behind me there was a door open to the cathedral and this giant chord rang out for about five seconds and then from the organ from the organ wow i hadn't heard it before and that's the very organ that used to be there when it was the chris it's the same organ that when it was the crystal cathedral Mm -hmm. it was sent out and refurbished and whatnot but it's the same one so i heard that and i was like okay thanks for that (laughs) uh so do you think that satan can work his way in there if you're praying for a sign you're opening yourself up that's called spiritualism you're involved in all these things i i I have serious questions where they're going with this whole thing and as as i look at it and i look at the ecumenicalism of this entire project that's what they said in this clip actually right here um it really makes me question Satan is preparing people to accept a version of Jesus that is not like the Jesus of the Bible because he's preparing the way for the Roman Catholic Church to step in and they're preparing the way for Satan to ultimately become the cosmic Christ. And so that right there of stamping into everybody's mind a Catholic picture of who Jesus is I believe is a real problem in the ter- in the great controversy. Satan's servants, with their faces lightened up and shined with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place and proclaim the message from heaven. What is the message from heaven? What's the message from heaven? The three angels' message, right? Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Right? He made the heavens and the earth. It's really interesting to me that that was our main mission. I mean, if you really want to know what is it that our ministry is doing, we're telling the three angels' message. Don't have the character of the world. Get out of these spiritual confusions. Don't, don't, Don't be caught up in these churches that literally are numbered with the mother church that is sweeping everybody underneath all those roads that lead back to Rome. Don't be a part of these systems because Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city that made the the nations drink of the wine and the wrath of her fornication, right? Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Don't get caught up in this reinterpreting of all these different church dynamics. I believe that we had a mission and that mission is, is, is what our church should be doing. By thousands of voices all over the earth, a warning will be given. What is that warning? That warning is the three angels' message. And it says that, that miracles will be wrought, sick will be healed, signs and wonders will follow the believers, and Satan also works to counterfeit those wonders. Did you know that Mrs. White said that a miracle is not enough evidence for you to even believe that it came from God? She said that miracles will be wrought. Why? Because just like at Jesus' day, the miracles wouldn't have even saved those people. Didn't Didn't the Pharisees say, why don't you come down off that cross and show us that you can come down there and then we'll believe? Really? You didn't believe that I just raised Lazarus from the dead? Really? You didn't believe all those miracles that you saw in my face? This would make you believe? Even that miracle wouldn't have made you believe. And that's why we must be living by faith, not by sight. Luke 5.32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Luke 15.7 says, I say to you likewise that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 persons who need no repentance. You know what's interesting about saying you're sorry? If I say I'm sorry and I do it again and again and again, am I truly sorry? So a repentance is what? Turning away from that activity, right? If I'm mean to my wife, I'm sorry, I yelled at you, and I do it again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. What's going to happen to me saying I'm sorry? She's not going to believe me. You have to turn away from that activity, and I see that theme throughout the Bible. 
Luke 24, 47 says, and that repentance and remission of turning away from sin is what we should be preaching in his name to everyone beginning with God's people. Turn away from the sin, and then we need to begin to, to outreach that same message. Does anybody have any questions about what you just saw? Is it clear? The most alarming thing to me is that we are being sold through this production a version of Jesus that is not based on the Bible. To me, that's the most alarming thing that you're burning into your memory, a picture of Jesus that is not based on the Bible. That to me is problematic because that gives the devil room to make stuff up. And when he has scenes like John the Baptist, if, if you guys ever saw that scene when John the Baptist pops out and Jesus like, kind of startles Jesus and Jesus is like, oh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist looks crazy and Jesus goes, oh, still not eating meat, are you? A little jab on the little vegetarians right there, right? There's so many things like that through that. When John the Baptist was going to go tell Herod that he should not be in a relationship with his brother's wife, Jesus tells him in the chosen, don't go do that. Do you know how problematic that is? So now the very guy that's telling you that you should not engage in immorality, he never said, don't, don't say anything about that. He didn't say that. That's not, that's not biblical. So now you're presenting a picture of Jesus that tells him not to go and do that, and John the Baptist disregards Jesus and goes and does it anyway. That also is problematic to me. There's problems like this all smattered throughout this production. Anybody else got a question? I just found it, I just found it interesting. Um, some, maybe a few years ago, I went to a concert, and slightly off topic, but um, I found it interesting how these Christian singers and performers are now doing movies in Hollywood, and they're like, they're asked, so why are you allowing Hollywood to do your story? And their answer, I barely remember what it was, because it wasn't satisfactory to me. It's like, why would you allow an industry that doesn't is Doesn't care definitely, about your morals. No, not only that, but doesn't care about you, period. Correct. Um, how you look, how you're portrayed, they, you're giving them the rights to do with your character whatever they want. Right. That does not seem right to me. Right. Correct. I believe that we are coming into a day and age that we need to be very careful with what we allow into our minds. I'm very careful what I read. And, and, and I feel very secure in my belief. Like, I'm not on the fence with anything. There's probably nothing anyone in this room or even in this world could tell me that would dislodge my belief in God at this point. But I don't want somebody steering my belief away from what God has put in His Word or the Spirit of Prophecy. I pretty much read those two books. The Bible, Spirit of Prophecy. I don't want to even give the devil a foothold at any other position. Please, I would like you to elaborate on Psalm 150. Psalm whenever, 150. Yeah, whenever I'm talking to people about music, they referred me to one, Psalm 150. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, anybody else got a question while I'm looking this up? Psalm 150. Psalm 150, the whole thing. Let me read it to you. Praise the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts, and praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet, and praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. The psaltery is a lyre, and I think it's a stringed instrument, right? I think so. Praise Him with the timber and the dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him with the loud cymbals. 
Praise Him upon high-sounding cymbals, and let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise, praise you, the Lord. I don't think that there's anything wrong with praising God with instruments. I don't think that there's anything wrong with using a cymbal. I don't think that there's anything wrong with certain drums and even drum patterns. Life is rhythmic, right? And somebody brought this up when I was studying music. They brought this up very interestingly. God created creation that their music that they design is often how they move. What does a whale sound like? What does a whale move like? What does a bird sound like? How does a bird move? What does man sound like? What do we like? What do we respond to? Rhythm, right? What does man move like? Dunk, 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 dunk. We like things that we sound like we move, and many of the, uh, the animals, what does a snake sound like? Smooth, very smooth and subtle and this and that, right? So, so God made rhythm. It's part of music. But when you take certain types of rhythm and you take certain types of instruments and you do things with them, it causes reactions in you. I'll give you an example. How many of you know who Kanye West is? You know who Kanye West is, okay? So Kanye West was a rapper who came out of that and is now identifying, so to say, as a Christian. That's debatable, but for the sake of the argument, let's just say that he's Christian. He went on the David Letterman show, and when he went on the David Letterman show, David Letterman said, I went to one of your Sunday services, you made all this music for it, and it was beautiful. What do you do different that you do now for your Sunday service that you don't do in your music? And you know what he said? He said, I removed certain instruments. I did not play the 808s. I actually took the 808s out of the music. Any musicians in the room? What's an 808? Anybody know? They call it the program drum. If I were to beat on something, we can, we can mimic a certain sound beating on something, but we actually have computers now that can make sounds that we actually can't physically beat on. And so an 808 is a sound that we have nothing in our world that we can actually beat on to make that sound. It's such a low frequency sound that it does something inside of your brain. So I'm not a musician like that. So I don't know what that is. So I go on the internet and I go, hey Google, what is an 808 and what does an 808 do? And you know what blew my mind when I figured this out? They call it the programming drum. And they say, even Kanye West said this in his interview, he said, it's that low, low beat drum that makes you go into a hypnotic state and then they tell you in the music, shoot this person, snort this drug, take this thing, do this thing with this girl, do this and that, and they're programming this into people. And he said, that's not okay in a spiritual setting. That's Kanye West. That's a major musician that understands the intricacies of the music. And so you know what I learned about music? You can look this up. Here's a piece of homework for you. At 40 hertz, if we play music at 40 hertz, do you know it has a healing effect? It actually calms us. In fact, they've been doing experiments right now with killing cancer cells by playing music and frequencies to it. They've come up with a, an ability to kill 60% of cancer cells simply by playing music to it. But if you play low hertz to somebody, it makes somebody go into a altered state of consciousness that makes you have impulse thinking. So the lower the music is, the more impulsive you become. Why do you think some of the music is sitting there going, do, 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 go be like this, go be like this, and everybody goes out and be like that? Do you think that that's appropriate in, this, in the worship setting? Absolutely not. And so that's why... I don't think there's something wrong with beating a kettle drum. You can hear a symphony. There's different instruments in there, and Psalms 150 is telling me that there is a wide variety of instruments that you can praise God with. But when you take those instruments and accentuate certain parts, it has certain types of reactions in our physical world, which causes you to do certain things. Rhythmatic music is very hypnotic. So if it's more pushed on the rhythmatic than it is on the melody or the harmony, it causes you to go into those states, uh, altered states of consciousness. I suggest that you do some research on that. I'm just giving you a quick brush stroke. Um, I have a question. Spirit, somebody, uh, 
Mike's coming. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Jackie. I was, while I was studying music education um, in Jamaica, we have a dance that's called the Kumina. Mm. That's like a ritual. It came from the ancestries, and it's really spirit worship. Mm. And when you dance to the beat, your feet has to be in contact with the ground because mm. you are in contact with the spirits. Mm. So the instructor wanted us to go to watch a presentation at the um, Jamaica house, but I had chosen not to go. And then when they returned, they were excited to tell me the story because she instructed them, do not go in the circle. Do not go near the circle. Oh, wow. So when the drum started and one curious student went into the circle and within a couple of seconds she was pulled in the middle of the circle by the spirit and she was on her back fluttering wow. and so they had to take her out of the circle and use certain rhythms on the drum to get that spirit out of her wow so that drum is not something to be taken lightly yes <laughs> you know it's I, satan uses it yes and i and i know that god will will, will give us instruments in heaven and said when jesus was crucified everyone stopped playing their harps and there was silence in heaven i mean i wonder is there some way that like <clears throat> music is very much a part of god's creation and 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 so if music was able to cast out a demon out of soul just playing certain types of music will it work in the reverse if you can cast it out can you play certain types of music that get it in that only makes logical sense to me so I think that we need to be careful of that. And there's a difference between dancing around. I'm excited and I'm dancing around. We like to move. We're humans that like to move. But if you're sitting there dancing like it's in the club and you're shaking it like you're basically having married things on the dance floor, there's a problem with that. Does that make sense? So the way you move your body can actually be a disgrace to God or if you're excited about something, we are humans, we have emotions. God created emotions. Is it wrong to be angry? Is it evil to be angry? Is it sinful to be angry? Not at all. God's anger constantly waxed hot against the Israelites, right? I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to take them out. In fact, leave me alone, Moses. Let, me, let my anger subside. God gets angry. Jesus turned over the tables in the, in the, in the thing. Why are you making my house of prayer a, 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 a den of thieves, right? Anger is an emotion that God gave you, and all of these emotions we are allowed to hear, but if I get angry with my brother and wish him dead, is that same emotion now a problem? Absolutely. So think about that. Moving your body, I don't believe, is necessarily evil in that context, and that's what I think David was saying. But I think there's ways that you can move your body that is in, bad, in a bad context. Anybody else? That was a good question. Thank you. Um, is dance the same dance that has always been around, or has dance evolved? I bet you it's evolved. But you know what? If you went back in time and you could actually watch what a Babylonian worship ceremony looked like, I guarantee you it looks like our clubs. I don't think, I, don't, I, I wonder even if the music and the tunes, because you think demons have been around for a long time and they're inspiring people. Yeah, I've, heard, I've seen enough videos of the Rolling Stones guys going, I couldn't play the guitar and then all of a sudden the, something came over me and I played that song. Well, who knows that music that's been translated down for cultures and generations and you know, those rhythms and those, those particular melodies and stuff, I guarantee you probably come from ancient cultures. So. I think there's a lot of interesting dynamics here and, and you know, dancing, I think that that is a, a, a very questionable thing that I, I, I get uncomfortable when I see it in a church setting in a way of just like, you know, I don't know. I think there's a one way to be excited about it, but there's another way that's really too close to a worldly style that bothers me. But I would say pray about it if you're into that kind of a thing. Um, so, like, 
Satan was the master of music. He could yeah. sing in like four different parts, mm -hmm. and he was a very good musician. So that like shows how he can use music to us in a bad way. Correct. In fact, if you actually analyze Hollywood versus the music industry, Hollywood looks like child's play compared to how dark the music industry is. The music industry is very, 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 those, those people that are in those top positions are very extremely satanic. And, and you see it. I mean, you can see what happened to Beyonce. You can see what happened to, um, you know, those people that have achieved the top. Michael Jackson, you know, these people have in, in, achieved incredible fame and success on a level that many actors don't even get close to. And so I think that it's because music cuts straight through the, the brain and goes right into our hearts. And music is one of the avenues that really can draw us in, just like the story I told you about Satan. He was up in heaven, hates Jesus, but then all of a sudden gets wrapped up in the music and starts singing adoration to Jesus. So that tells me that music is extremely powerful. I would add just one thing. Sure. They all start in church, you know. Yeah. Whitney Houston, I mean, you name it, Michael Jackson. Yeah. You know, they all start in church. Yeah. 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 Because, you know, it's interesting that the devil, he, he, he recognizes and he often uses people that were on God's side at one point in time. I think that some of the, and I'm going to say this very cautiously, some of, of, of the worst damage that we've, that we've done to God's causes have come from God's people. And it's almost like I think God, Satan uses them, whether he used the Jewish nation, whether he used um, Christianity, whether he used what was originally his church, Catholicism. I mean, that was God's church that got hijacked over the centuries and taken over because Satan's kicking it in God's face going, really, these are your people right here? The ones that you claim are your, follow like your followers? Look at what they've been doing to you. I think Satan loves that. His ultimate goal is to poke at God. And so I think that we need to be better about sharing with our young people. Church is something that we want young people to get involved in. Come and share this music, but don't use this as a stepping stone to go out and get enticed by the world. Use it to glorify God. There's a question back there. Mine is called sort of a um, complicated question and a transition. Um, have you ever heard about uh, stem cell research that actually changed an individual's DNA? No, but I really believe that that, that is, is something very interesting. The devil's working on every level, and if he can molecularly, you know, in, in the very fine uh -huh. programming of who we are, can change us, then that, yeah, that's scary stuff. I've, I've heard of, of this research that actually th the study was done and it's found that the individual's DNA was changed over time. Yeah. So even if that person had a child, yeah. it wouldn't be his. Yeah, interesting. So, right. so, so I'm looking now at the statement that was made after the um, evil one performs his delusions and counterfeits. The church needs to and will be presenting God to the world. Mm -hmm. How is the church going to do that if or all our concepts or, or, or being are being transformed by his infusions? Because what does the, what does the Bible say that it, God wants from our mind? Be transformed, have this mind in you, right? To bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. Mm -hmm. He is promising that He will transform us and complete the good work that He started in us. He will make us into His image. If we fell away from the image of God, God's reinstating that, and in the end gets to the point where He finishes, seals people's minds, and seals that thing in there, and steps back and goes, here is what my completed work looks like. And yet He's not going to do it without our consent. Without our consent. As a church... Why does Mrs. White say that we can hasten the second coming of Jesus? What does that mean? What do we have anything to do with it? Right? Does it make sense to you at all, any logical sense, that God is a, is a God that's literally just waiting for something on the clock? I can't go pick him up yet. 
I'm gonna, I, just, I know people are getting murdered and people are getting raped and people are getting drug addicts and people are doing all these things. Does it make any logical sense to you that a loving God would sit there and literally wait for time on a clock to say, nope, can't pick them up. I know there's a lot of people pain and suffering, but it's not the right time yet. Does that make any sense? No, whatsoever, it does not. In fact, God is dying to come and, and take us back with him. And what is he waiting for? He's waiting for a people that surrender completely to him. So they don't even, like, if you're dead to sin, you don't get involved in these things. You're dead to it. I think our greatest problem is we don't know how to surrender to Jesus. And we don't know how to let him in our hearts. That's why the condition of the Laodicean is Jesus is knocking on the door of our hearts. We haven't invited him in yet. That's our purpose as a church. Classical music. Classical music. I think classical music is a wonderful thing, but there are some pieces of classical music that were created when those people were into the secret societies of the day and things, right? I've heard things about, I think, Moonlight Sonata, I think, was one of the ones that was written in the, I think. Don't quote me on that. Maybe there's a piece of homework for you. <laughs> but, but there is some things that, you know, it's like if that's what the artists were into, I don't want to support that stuff, even though I don't know if the music is necessarily going to lead me astray. I just, eh, I'd avoid that. I'd have you go uh, listen to Mozart or, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, uh, Beethoven, there's Mozart, well, there's Beethoven, Bach. Bach. Yeah. No, uh, the one that I'm thinking about is... Yeah. I like Mozart. Yeah, yeah. Chopin, all those. I, I listen to classical music. There is actually really scientific studies that talk about that 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 helps increase your your memory, your thinking, and and that is very positive. It it shows you what a powerful medium that was because it's lasted for centuries and we're still listening to it. I mean, our music today doesn't even hold weight compared to that type of music. So. And my kids, they, they, they're learning instruments, so I'm trying to get them involved in music. My son's learning the guitar, they play the piano, my daughter plays the violin, and, and so I think there's some very, very powerful things about music that we should all learn to play and listen to, and I think it's a, a neat thing. Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, on music that music, uh, from what I've noticed, is extremely powerful and it goes with certain activities and settings. In other words, there's some music aside from religion, okay, having nothing to do directly with religion, just consider music out there in the world. There's certain music that you will not hear in certain places because it doesn't go, right. okay? For instance, you're at a funeral. There's certain music that's not a good idea for a funeral. Can we agree on that? Yeah. 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 Now let me ask you this question. Is there certain music that's not a good idea in the church? Yeah. And so if, if, the, if we're saying, you know, if I'm trying to promote something, uh, you can't have the opposite happen in, in the background. And so we know that spiritual things are spiritual and the body and the things working of the carnal are carnal. And so if you have music that appeals to your body, it's clashing with the spirit because it's appealing to me, wanting to go, wanting to move, when actually I, I'm, I'm trying to have a spiritual experience. Did you, did you know that Mrs. White made a comment of, of out of all the churches, which church had, had the, the most correct music or the best music? You know, she made a comment on that. Which church do you think it is? You're correct. The Catholic Church. Now, why would she say that? Why would she make a statement like that? That's an odd statement to say. Because what we talked about, what does music do? It opens the heart so you can receive the message. Mm -hmm. So what if the message is error? You open the heart so that it can receive the error. And what do we do in our churches? There's certain types of music that close the heart so that we cannot hear the truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why... Music is powerful. Yeah. Do some research on that. There's ministries that talk about these issues. Yeah. I, I, I feel very strongly about this particular topic as well. I was reflecting on the fact that if there are certain types of music that doesn't belong in the church, yeah. then it doesn't belong. 
belong in my life. Yes, right. yes, yes. I it want to speak. Belong in my life because I am the church. You are the church in this you building and outside there at play. Amen, amen. I want to speak to this this effect right here. Watch this church. How many of you felt uncomfortable with at least one or two clips that I showed today, whether it was from, from Hollywood or whatnot? How many of you felt uncomfortable? Yeah. You better feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I want you to consider the work that I do. I labored this strong and hard with God. I have come into churches and I have played extremely satanic images inside of God's house. When have you ever seen Superman, Batman, Marvel, anything in the very center of God's sanctuary? When have you seen that? And I said, Lord, have mercy upon me. If I am damaging your church, take me out. I give you permission. Don't let me do this. Take the money away. Take everything away from me. I do not want to damage your church. Why do you think God would ask for his people to take a lamb and slice its throat and kill it? Have you ever killed a lamb? Have you ever killed an animal? I take bugs outside. I capture them in my house and walk them and let them go. I cannot kill a big animal. There's no way. Why would God ask you to do such a disgusting thing? Because he wanted to show you what sin truly is. If you feel uncomfortable inside of this church, seeing certain images, and you go home and you don't feel uncomfortable watching that in your home, there's a problem. You need to feel uncomfortable here, and you need to feel uncomfortable at home. Do not watch these things in your home if you feel uncomfortable in here. If you can't watch it in the sanctuary, and you can't bring that movie or that piece of music here, don't play with it and don't look at it. Does that make sense? That, that right there should be your barometer for whether or not does this come from God. What you do in church should be easily what you do in home. And they, you know, that, that doesn't mean, that can be probably taken out of context. Of course, there's things behind closed doors in your home that you would not do in church. Of course. But you get the point. Anything else? All right. Let's bow our heads for one more word of prayer. And as I pray, I want you all, as your, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I know what a war this is. I truly was in this particular space. So as your eyes are closed, I want you to do something for God. If you struggle with these kind of things, maybe in your home, in your life, and you don't know where to start, I want you to simply just raise your hand. And every eye is bowed, every eye is closed, every head is bowed. No one is going to see but God, but I want you to raise your hand if you want God to help you untangle your life from some of these things that you've seen, whether it's media, whether it's music, whether it's whatever. you got things in your life that you know you want to change, but you don't know how. Just raise your hand as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you see this church. You see the hands that are up, Lord. We all have things in our lives that we need to change. And Lord, we are raising, we're taking the first step. We want you involved in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, help us to be the people that see you coming in the clouds. Help us to be ready. Help us to know how to turn away from sin and to turn our eyes on you so that the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.